Our second commentator um, is Andrei uh, Kurkov, um, Ukrainian novelist, movie scriptwriter, and essayist. <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to pass you the microphone. Yeah, uh, well, uh, since I'm not an acad academic, I mean, I enjoyed these uh, papers very much. Uh, and I, uh, I mean, although I recognized all this stuff uh, because, I mean, I experienced uh, the same uh, staying in Ukraine for all the Maidan time and then on. Uh, but uh, uh, first I will actually uh, refer to Martin Dichok's uh, paper. Uh, I had several uh, very interesting experiences, especially uh, what is strange with BBC. Recently with BBC Hard Talk I was there. And suddenly the presenter was us putting in the question data she got from Russia today, obviously not uh, approved, not not proved and not correct. Like I mean, she was asking, "What do you? What can you say about uh, 500 uh, people from the cultural elite of Russia banned from visiting Ukraine?" There were actually 12 persons listed on this list, not 500. Then she said that oh, all Russian TV channels are banned and are not accessible on Ukrainian territory. And and this is actually somehow. Uh, uh, made me think that uh, sometimes the Western journalists uh, have tendency to pick up the Russian journalistic tendencies. So they, they are taking sides or they, are, they, they, are, they want also to participate in, uh, not in the propaganda war, but somehow to, to become more uh, uh, affiliated to one uh, of the sides. Uh, the reason might be actually, which is, which was also the case you mentioned, uh, that uh, during Orange Revolution, uh, practically every uh, big TV channel, every uh, um, important radio station or newspaper sent their envoys, their uh, correspondents to Kiev. They were based all the time in Kiev, mostly in the Hotel Dnipro and Hotel Ukraine. This time, they thought. Uh, that, well, this is uh, the second time, we'll save some money, we'll send everybody from Moscow to Kyiv. Uh, you have in the world much more Russophiles than Ukrainophiles. People who tend to work as correspondents in Russia, they, they tend to love Russia, to, to love Russian language, to speak Russian, and to see lots of things from the Russian point of view. And I met lots of French, uh, actually, mostly French and Italian journalists, uh, who were sent from Moscow to cover the events in Ukraine during Maidan, who were putting their attitude into their questions. Uh, third, uh, maybe, um, uh, remark. You mentioned uh, Avakov's posting, actually, the uh, his news uh, on FB. Uh, exactly during these events, uh, starting from, actually, from Maidan times, uh, Facebook became the official source of information for Ukrainian media. And I mean, it's 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 incredible that you you get uh, uh, news uh, on Ukrainet, and very often, actually, probably ten to fifteen percent of the news items are sourced from Facebook. Sometimes, uh, 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 Facebook pages with assumed uh, personality. The same uh, thing is actually is used. I think is used already by the Ukrainian side purposely, uh, since Ukraine doesn't have correspondence uh, on the occupied territories. They are using uh, Facebook nicks of people apparently who are staying there, who are Ukrainian patriots and who are reporting on the events from the point of view of Ukrainian patriot. You never, you can never check whether they are. Uh, some of these actually nicknames are so clever that they are tapping into the secret uh, radio channels uh, uh, of Russian troops. And uh, there is a certain Yarchuk, Dmitro Yarchuk, who reports regularly how many uh, Russian soldiers and officers killed uh, in each battalion and from where this Russian battalion comes, etc. Uh, Oleg Yarchuk, yeah. And I mean, this is a. Uh, well, I mean, th this is very creative. Uh, I mean, I, I enjoy it, but I mean, this uh, moves, uh, removes the, uh, I would say, the news industry from the news, from the information industry towards the propaganda war. And uh, probably this is the only, uh, I would say, financially uh, accessible instrument uh, Ukraine has uh, against uh, Russia today and all the Russian very well budgeted medias. Uh, if I mentioned... Uh, uh, yes, yes. Another thing is that uh, Russia is very actively inviting Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian patriots to come to Russia to take part in talk shows. 
and uh, most of them uh, refuse. I mean, I already, I, I don't go there, and I, but I, I don't want to go there anyway until Putin is alive, sorry, uh, or in power. Uh, but uh, what was noticed that actually the... Uh, the, all these talk shows are very well orchestrated, and people who are invited there, they are very significant personalities, public personalities for, for Russia. They have their speeches prepared. They need somebody to, uh, to have as a target. And in this case, I mean, I, I watched several programs when the Ukrainians came, and they could pass their message only with a T-shirt, uh, which pro-Ukrainian T-shirt, because actually they were addressed all the time, and they didn't have chance to answer. And in, in, in uh, the other thing is that when you uh, Russian uh, TV journalists come to Ukraine and they interview people in the streets or somewhere, uh, there was a case in Odessa, then they doctor the interviews and they, they make actually uh, it uh, look that like the people said completely different things that they wanted. And there was a scandal with one lady from uh, Russian theater, I think, in Odessa. Uh, I don't remember the exact case, but I mean, it is all, uh, everything is now in internet, yes, but uh, then she had to explain lots of times to Ukrainian journalists that she didn't say what was shown on TV because it was just cut, uh, cut to measure uh, the Russian ideology. Uh, coming to uh, Vladimir Kulik, uh, well, I, th th there is not much to say except that uh, I, 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 I totally agree that uh, in the last 10 years, the, the border uh, between I would say pro-Russian uh, moods and pro-Western uh, sympathies uh, really moved dramatically and very swiftly moved to the east, and we have now exactly uh, Donbas and uh, Crimea uh, still uh, against the rest of Ukraine. But this was because actually, uh, in, sp in, in spite of the fact that uh, Donbas and Crimea were parts of uh, Ukrainian national. Uh, political space, and were parts of Ukrainian national financial space, which means they were happily using grievous Ukrainian currencies, but they were never parts uh, of uh, Ukrainian informa national information space and cultural space. And so, in fact, actually, they were fed by Ukraine uh, material, materially, and spiritually, they were actually fed and very well nourished by the Russian uh, side. And uh, in the, uh, in, in the other border regions, like Sumy, for example, in Chernigov, strangely enough, you, you don't have this the same tendency. But also, uh, I, I will talk about this uh, tonight, uh, this is also a question of uh, difference between uh, Russian mentality and Ukrainian mentality, and here I am not talking about the borders of the state, because Russian mentality is collective and Ukraine is individualist. And uh, somehow uh, the uh, Donbass uh, political elite uh, managed to conserve, uh, to, to, to prevent uh, population from uh, uh, stopping, become, uh, sort of from becoming individualist because uh, they, they retained the, the Soviet mentality of uh, collectivism and collective responsibility and uh, uh, together with this comes the passivity. So, I mean, they, they, they were taking what they were given, they were not asking the questions, they were given the answers without asking the questions. And in this sense, also, uh, the proof uh, how it, in, it influences uh, the economical life is that uh, in uh, Donbass is the lowest level of uh, small uh, business enterprises and small entrepreneurs. Because if you don't have, if you have co collective mentality, uh, any initiative is punishable and is a uh, risky uh, business. Uh, so so we, we, we had somehow two circles uh, crossing each other. I mean, like uh, Russian spiritual or Russian spiritual information and cultural space was encroaching on Ukrainian territory. Uh, and... Uh, it was ignored. Unfortunately, it was ignored partially because actually no Ukrainian uh, national politician wanted to interfere or inter was interested to interfere. Yeah, because they, we, we didn't have uh, state builders, in fact, uh, in, in the history of post-Soviet uh, Ukraine. And, and this is uh, one of the main reasons of the tragedy we have today. And uh, finally, I, I will not ask you questions. So I mean, I think w uh, I will save time for the audience. <laughs> yes. And uh, 
what uh, Professor Ladislav Rinevich said, uh, the resurrection of Stalinism <coughs> and uh, the uh, restoration of the Soviet values as opposite to the Western values, mixed up with uh, Christian values, uh, is, uh, is really a very dangerous uh, tendency, uh, taking part uh, practically on all the territory of uh, Russia. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, also, I mean, they were trying to <coughs> the Russian ideologies. Although I mean, because Russia was ideological state, Ukraine was never ideological state since uh, 1991 because the nationalists played very uh, uh, small role, I would say, and they were no uh, allowed to approach the, the 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 offices of state control. Yeah, but but I remember one thing which uh, was uh, very. Uh, Quite very important discussion uh, when Russians felt uh, Russia felt leadership that uh, that uh, in uh, Yanukovych's time they they can actually also uh, impose Rus uh, Soviet values uh, on uh, uh, on Ukraine. They started uh, this project of joint uh, history textbooks for Russian and Ukrainian schools so that this the history would not differ in these two countries. And this is what you were. Saying and, and I think this should be remembered always because every country has its history and this history very often also in Western Europe is in conflict with the history books in the other uh, uh, yeah. countries. I mean, like uh, between Germany and France, uh, uh, there is no joint uh, history book. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>